So ceramics um, are one type of substance that often uses silicates. Um, the definition of ceramic traditionally is um, an inorganic non-metallic solid prepared from powder, some sort of a powder mixed with water and then heated. It's used in things like bricks, tiles, pottery, dishes, insulating elements, many, many uses of ceramics. Um, typical properties of ceramics is that they are hard, strong, they do not conduct electricity, and they tend to be brittle. You hit them with a hammer, they're going to shatter into small pieces. There are different types of ceramics. Silicate ceramics are composed of aluminosilicates. So you've got the silicate structure, but some of the silicon atoms have been replaced with aluminum atoms. So it's silicate with aluminum in it. And um, naturally occurring aluminosilicates, as they weather, will produce clays. Clays can be found in the earth. You know, some people have a lot of clay mixed in with the soil in their yard, and it doesn't drain very well. Um, that's hard to get that clay out and make it into anything useful, but you can find large deposits of clays, and then you can make them into pottery and different things. Um, and those clays form by the, the weathered powder forms of aluminosilicates that get mixed with water. You take that clay, um, which is malleable, and it's not brittle, it's not hard, it's not very strong, and you heat it, and that causes bonds to form and changes the properties of it, and it becomes a ceramic. Without the heating, it's not a ceramic. So can you artificially form clay? Yes. Okay, so you don't have to necessarily You do not necessarily have to go find the clay and dig it up. You can make it. Yeah. So one, one clay that's called kaolinite has this crazy looking formula. So it's got aluminum and silicon and oxygen and also hydroxides in there. Above about 1500 degrees, it undergoes irreversible chemical and structural changes. And it becomes a white ceramic solid with an extended network of silicon oxygen and aluminum oxygen tetrahedra. It's like that silicate structure we saw before, but some of the silicons are aluminum. Um, kaolinite is the most important component in porcelain. Porcelain originated in China, and um, dishes made out of porcelain are still referred to as China, right? You have a China hutch, and you have your good China that you take out for Christmas, right? Beautiful white plates. Um, so that's one type of ceramic. Another type are oxide ceramics, and these include aluminum oxide and magnesium oxide. These are physically and chemical, chemically stable at very high temperatures, and that makes them useful in things like um, industrial furnaces, high-speed cutting tools that tend to get very, very hot. Uh, crucibles, remember the crucibles? Did we use the crucibles? Well, we carried them around at the very least. Um, little white, almost look like mini teacups. Those are made out of oxide ceramics. Um, you can heat them very hot so they're glowing red on the bottom and they're not going to melt. Oh, uh, we, I think we only heated or, or did an experiment with the Gooch crucibles, but I think the very first experiment we carried the little uh, porcelain ones around just to practice. But yeah, then I don't think we actually used them, which is kind of sad. But we'll get over it. Um, they're useful as, as heating elements and in fireproofing. So aluminum oxide and magnesium oxide. And then there are non-oxide ceramics. So these include Si3N4, Bn, and Sic. So you'll notice there's no oxygen in here, right? So silicon nitride has a, um, a structure that's similar to silica, but it's got nitrogens instead of oxygens. This is used in engine parts and non-metallic ball bearings. Um, ceramics um, often have physical and chemical properties that are different than metals and make them desirable, right? So when I think of a ball bearing, I think of something made out of steel or some other metal. In ball bearings in the wheels of your skateboard or in your car wheels or something, and they roll nicely, right? Well, they also conduct electricity, 
And if you need a ball bearing in a situation where you don't want it to conduct electricity, then a non-oxide non ceramic would be good because it's not going to conduct electricity. Another one is boron nitride. Boron nitride is isoelectronic with C2. So if you look in the periodic table, boron and nitrogen are on opposite sides of carbon. Right? Carbon has four valence electrons. Boron has three. Nitrogen has five. If you put them together, they have the same number of electrons <coughs> as two carbon atoms put together. And so they can form similar structures to those that carbon makes, including structures similar to graphite that are layered, and also structures so, uh, similar to diamond. So you can get, uh, you can use these for high temperature lubricants, for abrasives, and for cutting tools. And then silicon carbide, which remember we asked Siri what the formula for silicon carbide was, and she told us it was sick. S I C, sick. Um, that's not actually a molecule. It's a network covalent atomic solid with an equal number of silicon and carbon atoms. It will take on a diamond structure, but half the carbon atoms are silicon atoms. So it's the same structure, but it's half silicon, half carbon. And that's also used as an abrasive, um, high temperature materials, um, and is, is uh, useful as an additive to steel to change the qualities of the steel. So those are ceramics. And then we have cement. Um, cement was first discovered by the Romans a long time ago. And they used lime, volcanic ash, and clay mixed with water, made a pourable slurry that would harden into a rock-like substance. So this is awesome because instead of finding a rock and carving it down into the shape that you need, which is very difficult, you can actually make this cement and pour it into a shape and let it harden and have something very similar. Um, the most common cement is Portland cement. Um, port and that has nothing to do with Portland, Oregon. Uh, Portland cement is a powdered mixture of mostly limestone, which is calcium carbonate, um, silica, SiO2, we've talked about that, and smaller amounts of alumina, iron oxide, and gypsum. And it reacts with water in a way that produces a rock-like substance. There's a, a series of complex different reactions. Um, and this is different than what happens with a clay. Clays lose water as they set or harden. But Portland cement forms, uh, does these chemical reactions. And it does so without being heated like ceramics require. So in the hardening process, you get a lot of silicon oxygen, silicon bridges that make us fibrous structures and hold things together really well. Concrete is different than cement. I find myself often using the terms interchangeably, but they're actually different. Concrete is a combination of Portland cement with sand and pebbles or gravel. And this is the most widely used building material in the world. And we've got it on our sidewalks. Um, Parts of this building are made out of it. It's used for all kinds of things. It dramatically revolutionized construction worldwide. Um, foundations, walls, buildings, etc. About half of all man-made structures are made out of concrete. A lot of concrete. Another substance we need to talk about is glass. So silica will melt above about 1,500 degrees. And if you cool it quickly, you get an amorphous structure known as glass. So if you, if you cool it slowly, you're, you may end up with something like um, a ceramic. But if you cool it quickly, you'll get glass. Um, silicate glass is transparent. You can see through it. It's impervious to water. And um, that makes it an outstanding material for windows and drinking glasses. Uh, the Romans, again, were the first to extensively develop glass making. Earlier peoples did make glass, but they didn't do it um, extensively. What the Romans did is they added sodium carbonate, which re reduced the melting point of silica. It's difficult to work with a substance that's only uh, only melts at a hundred. I'm sorry, that melts at 1,500 degrees Celsius. That's really really hot. By adding sodium carbonate, you can melt it at much lower temperatures. 
much easier to work with. There are forms of glass that we can melt very easily in a Bunsen burner flame. And then you can blow it and do all kinds of interesting things with it, and make it into whatever shape you want. And so the, the Romans developed glass blowing. You take melted glass on the end of a tube and you literally blow into the tube and you can make different spherical shapes. And, you know, the, the volumetric flasks we've used in class are made by blowing the glass into a round shape and then flattening the bottom. Other kinds of glass, um, vitreous silica or fused silica is, is a glass made from just um, silica, SiO2. It's very hard, it resists high temperatures, um, it doesn't expand much when you heat it, it's transparent to visible and ultraviolet light. So it's a really high quality glass, but it's very expensive because you have to work with it at really high temperatures. So it's only used when it's absolutely needed. Soda lime glass it is um, what we typically encounter. It's also called window glass. That's the most common modern glass. It's about 70% um, silica, and the rest of it is mostly um, Na2O and calcium oxide. It's transparent to light, visible light, um, but not ultraviolet. Um, I wouldn't count on that, though, for protecting you from a sunburn. Um, but you'll get less sun exposure um, through, the, like, the glass on your car window than if you would um, if you're just sitting out in the sun. It does have a high thermal expansion. And so when it's heated, it expands significantly. It's less expensive to make, and therefore it's much easier to form into desirable shapes, but it tends to crack under thermal shock. And so th these are not things that you want to heat up and then set on a cool surface, because they'll probably shatter. Borosilicate glass, um, or Pyrex, is made by adding boric oxide instead of calcium oxide. And this causes uh, the glass to expand less when heating, and so you can have heating and cooling cycles that would shatter soda lime glass, but do not shatter the borosilicate glass. Um, I had a, an experiment where my students needed to heat something in a test tube. They heated a powder in a test tube, and they're supposed to observe the color change. Well, some of the test tubes were borosilicate glass, they said Pyrex on them, and some of them were soda lime glass. And the soda lime test tubes had been put out instead of the Pyrex ones. And one after another, everybody's test tubes are breaking as they heat this, and we're like, what the heck? And then I'm like, oh, shoot, we got the wrong test tubes. Most lab glassware is made out of borosilicate glass. It is more expensive than soda lime. But you need to be able to heat the beaker without being worried that it's going to shatter on you. Leaded glass is often called crystal. You know, and if your mom has a cut glass or a crystal bowl or, you know, fancy wine goblets or something, we say they're made out of crystal. Well, it's not actually crystal. It is glass. But it's glass that contains lead oxide along with uh, silicon dioxide and other minor components. Um, the lead being in there gives it a higher index of refraction, which gives it a more brilliant appearance. It, it looks shinier and brighter and just more beautiful than regular glass. You can tell the difference between two um, like uh, wine glasses that are made out of, uh, one made out of leaded glass and one made out of soda lime glass because the leaded glass one will give a ringing sound when you tap it and the soda lime will not. Of course, if you, if you tap either of them too hard, they will break. Um, there's now a lot of lead-free crystal available um, because people are understandably concerned about lead toxicity. Um, the fact is, though, that if you are using crystal to drink wine out of or drink water out of during a meal, the liquid does not stay in the crystal long enough to leach out any significant amounts of lead. You do not want to use leaded crystal to store something in. Like if you've got a, a leaded crystal decanter that you're storing whiskey or scotch or something in, that would be a really bad idea because that's going to sit there for a long time and it will get lead into it.